in a minute to a couple of the more esteemed people than me. Um, but uh, today we've got, we've got my friend Abe Partridge here, and Abe is, is somebody who's done a variety of things in life, and I'll let him tell you more about those. But um, he's here today to talk to, to a class that I'm, I'm teaching about music menus and music culture and identity as it's related to, uh, to music in, in the Chattanooga community. And, um, and he's joined here with Dr. My Dr. Ralph Hood. One of the things that, um, that Abe's uh, known for is his, his podcast, Alabama Astronaut. And Alabama Astronaut was a podcast that Abe set up as a way to, uh, it really was a subject of the, the podcast, but it's a way to capture some of the music from certain handling churches. And so we brought Dr. Hood in here today because he's one of the world's foremost experts on that subject. And so I thought it would be a good opportunity for you folks to hear from the people who are going out into the world and looking at the ways in which music helps shape who we are in a variety of contexts. So my class is largely going out into music venues, but Abe's going out into churches. And Abe tells us right at the beginning of this podcast that he's not an ethno musicologist. <laughs> but I've told him all week that I've been telling you folks that he is very much an ethno musicologist, which is for the long words. Uh, it's just studying music as culture. That's all it really means. Okay, and well, I'm so, fine with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 get out and sort of That's observation, cool. immerse yourself, yeah. and, um, and see, you know, and understand how music operates as culture. And so I, I viewed um, Abe's podcast as something that really did a nice job of bringing that subject um, to a broader audience who then maybe could have a better understanding yeah. of the, the much maligned serpent handling stereotype. Um, as it relates to, in particular, the American South. But with that, I'll turn the floor over to these folks and, and uh, let them let them talk and let them lead the, the deal. Yeah. Thanks, folks. Well, thank you, Chad. This uh, I'm just honored to be here with y'all. And uh, I'll tell you, about three years ago, that was I, I was primarily making my living by uh, playing music, and. Uh, when the pandemic hit, of course, you know, most of the music venues all shut down. And so I, um, I was left with a lot of time. And uh, I used to pastor a church in Middlesbrough, Kentucky, when I was in my mid-20s. And uh, I had met a fellow there uh, named Jamie Coots, who was a, a, uh, a, he was a preacher who was uh, a p pastor of a church where they handled serpents. And and then um, <clears throat> we had a long conversation and he gave me his phone number, said, call me if you ever need anything. And uh, I uh, ended up going through a, a, some, uh, quite a crisis there and uh, I figured it was time for me to leave the church and I did whenever I was 27 years old and moved back to Mobile, Alabama and uh, joined the United States military. And I went off to a war in 2013. I came home in 2014. And whenever I came home, I was looking on the monitors there in the in the uh, hospital, and I saw Jamie Coots had died. His I saw his picture on it said "Serpent Handling Preacher Dies of Snake Bite," and, um, and then I started playing songs that I had been writing and everything, and uh, started showing my paintings. And uh, by 2019, I was on the West Coast playing some music with a friend of mine, and. He, he told me about uh, this book called Salvation on Sand Mountain. I read the book, and uh, inside the book was uh, Jamie Coots. And so when I read about Jamie, when I saw Jamie Coots there and the fact that I had met him and then the fact that I had saw where he had died, I had bought the book. Uh, and then when I read, when I read the book, uh, the, it coincided with the pandemic, and so I decided to go out and start. I just wanted to go see what it was all about. And then whenever I was there, uh, for the, I went the first time in June of 2020, and I heard songs that I had never heard before. And, uh, and then I found out about this guy right here, who has, I don't even know how many decades now, and you've spent, he spent in the, uh, in the serpent handling community. But uh, Dr. Hood here at UTC has an archive at their library. And... Uh, I engrossed myself in Dr. Hood's recordings that he had made and uh, listening really for the music uh, that he had captured. 
uh, and on his VHS tape, uh, taped services that he had. And I, I began to be really concerned about the music and try to figure out if it had ever been uh, properly documented. And I come to find out it, it had not. And I read Dr. Hood's book that he wrote on the matter called um, what, uh, Them That Believe. Them That Believe. And, uh, and, and there, was a, there, was a, there was actually a paragraph uh, or, a, or a chapter in, in that book on music. And, and one, of the, one, of the, one of the things I read in Dr. Hood's book, it said that uh, it was something along the lines of serpent handling music is largely undocumented. <laughs> And I was like, well, I know what I'm doing with my pandemic. And so, so I spent, uh, I've been spending the last three years of my life um, uh, in the same community that Dr. Hood has spent uh, so many years uh, uh, trying to get professional quality recordings of their music, which is unique to their faith. Uh, much, I mean, so, some, some of their songs are regular hymns, but some of them are also... Uh, they're, they're, they have lyrical compositions that they're the only people in the world that could sing them with honesty because n literally no one else in the world believes what they believe. And so uh, I've, been, I've been recording that and they made a podcast about it and back in June uh, I took a couple of serpent handlers to a music festival in Pineville, Kentucky called the Laurel Cove Music Festival and for the first time as far as I know, in, in history, there was a public, non-church performance of serpent handling gospel music. And uh, that's what I've been doing. But, uh, yeah, but, uh, but without, the, without the work of Dr. Hood here, I uh, certainly wouldn't have gotten near as far or be as, for, as informed as I am. But uh, how long have you been doing it there? How, how, long, how long have you been documenting this music, Dr. Hood? About or the, this this thing. Thirty-five. Years, 35. Plus, going back. Yeah. And you were a you were a professor here at UTC the whole yeah. time. Yeah. And when I came here, the the way I got involved in serpent handling is it was at Carson Springs. There had been two deaths from uh, at Carson Springs, and my my area of interest is psychology of religion, and so I went to the uh, they had a distinguished professor of religious studies who shall go nameless because he deserves it. And I, I, he was in the newspapers and there was a story on serpent hunters and their deaths and they interviewed this professor and, and he said, well, these people are ignorant, they don't understand that this is a, a suspect part of the gospel and they do it for these kinds of reasons. And so I said, well, have you ever been to a serpent hunting church? And he said, no. <laughs> it just said, he just knew what was wrong. So I then went to the Department of Sociology, where the sociologist who had commented on Serpent Hammer and said, these are ignorant people and they suffer from cultural deprivation. And, da, 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 da. and I asked him, have you ever been to a Serpent Hammer church? Where are they? And he said, no. So what was happening is everybody had an opinion about Serpent Hammer, but nobody ever did the groundwork the field work to get to know these people from within their perspective. And so, for instance, one nice comment about Jamie Coots and the music, it's true, the music has not been well documented. And so what he's doing and trying to make professional recordings is really important. But a cute story about Jamie Coots, because uh, I was at his funeral, and Jamie Coots had always said that if he'd ever been serpent bit, he would never get treatment, and so he got serpent bit and uh, didn't get treatment, and he died. But, and then I've been following the church and his family since then, because one of the things that happens in serpent hunting traditions is, generally speaking, death increases commitment to serpent hunting, not decreases. And we might talk about that later. But the important thing about it is Jamie Coots, one time I interviewed him, and he had a copperhead bite, and it was on his hand. And copperhead bites, they're not often lethal, but what they do is destroy tissue. So Jimmy Coots was, Jimmy Coots was a fantastic musician, absolutely fantastic. Mm -hmm. And he lost his finger mm -hmm. and it just rotted off and just had a bone. And he loved that because he used it to pick his guitar. <laughs> and, and then later on when he got in working on a car, knocked the bone off and he was upset because he lost the unique picking style he had. 
So the nice thing about Superman illustrations is their music is truly unique. They come from the soul. Many times, Superman traditions, they, they will sing, but not to the audience. They will go and, and stand in a corner and sing to the wall. So their music comes from an indigenous tradition and is always used to praise the Lord and reaffirm their beliefs, never for entertainment. Right. And part of the great stuff about some of the early music, we have music that comes out of the indigenous tradition before people heard external kind of music sources. Because part of the tradition, right, discourages people from TV, radios, playing the devil's music, that kind of stuff. So you get what's really unique and why it's so important what he's doing is you're actually documenting music that occurs nowhere else and comes authentically out of the beliefs of these indigenous people in the Appalachian Mountain region. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and right now uh, we're working on, uh, we're, we're, I'm still, um, we're currently working on season two of the podcast, which is going to go in depth on the, um, uh, some of the things that uh, I've been able to to gather about how that music, why it sounds like it does. It's really like a ferocious style of rock and roll music that um, you're, <laughs> I go to a rock and roll shows. I, I, I have a rock, roll, rock and roll band. Uh, <laughs> uh, I've never heard any rock and roll as good as what I've heard in the Serpent Hammer Church. And, uh, uh, and so, yeah, we're, we're, I'm, I'm busy in the work of currently trying to tell that story. And, and as to your part about it being, and it, you know, coming from uh, a people like separated, it is, it is amazing the, um, just how unique the, the development of that music was. And um, anyway, yeah, we've been involved in, in, in doing that. But uh, what, what, what else should we talk about, Chad? Well, one of the things that the that class is particularly interested yeah. in is the, the role that music plays in shaping identity. And so, you know, which I, I noticed in the <clears throat> practice of your book and some other places, there's some conversation about that. You know, and so you know, to speak to that, I think of the things that, one of the other things that I'd love to have the students hear about um, who are here today in particular is um, sort of the methods that you that are involved in the field. When you're out there and recording things and you're you're going into these spaces with other with other people, you know, who may or may not necessarily be open to you being there, but how do you work through and Dr. I think you can speak to this as well, because I think you've done a fair amount of ethnographic research as well. You know, but when you're out there, you know, what's the process? that you go through in order to begin to get, you know, really usable material. I mean, I know that, that and you said that your podcast was like some like 400 hours of interviews just with you, much less some of the other stuff. So there's a lot of coming through, but just to get that amount of information, um, I would think that, that both of you would probably say that relationships um, yeah. are sort of key to your... Yeah, to there's, there's a real simple ones, but first and foremost, the first thing you have to do is get to know and understand these people and them to know and understand and trust you. Yep. So in many cases, before I did any interview, I knew these people like for three years. And I not only go to the churches, but I go to their homes. I ride with them when they're going places, right? So what you've got to do is, it's like me walking up to you and saying, tell me some of the most intimate secrets about your life. Well, you may participate and tell me some stuff, but it won't really be very intimate. And you say, why would I reveal myself to you until I know that you care about me and I care about you, and then I'll tell you stuff. And so most of the information you gather often is not from formal interviews, but from being with the people and driving three years, three days to a, uh, or three hours to a, another church and being with them and talking to them. And they're talking to you. So it's like you, once you form friendships, much of what you learn about people is what you do when you're being friends. 
And one of the people, things that people worry about is you lose objectivity. But the answer is you don't want objectivity. I don't want to know something just objective about you. Well, I can always know that. I want to be able to get your subjectivity, what it is you feel, what it is you really think, and I can't get that until you and I have some kind of significant relationship where we care about one another. Yeah. I can't say it no better than that. I will say this, though, that it's through, uh, uh, from, uh, in, I will, in the serpent handling community right now, uh, Dr. Hood is, is considered, he's considered one of the brethren. I mean, Dr. Hood is looked at as, as, as a member of, of the faith. They look at him just like he's one of them, and that's because uh, he's, he's always maintained a great level of respect and, and came in and, um, and, and not try to what they call strip mine, you know, a community and take something from it and leave it in disarray and go out and sell what you got, you know. And, uh, but, his, you know, the, I had the same experience. I mean, I didn't just start going to a church with a recorder. Uh, I had to go... But some 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 of them I had to go for several months and uh, before I was allowed to even to even hit the record button. So um, and and now it is all about it's all about you know treating other people. I don't know. Somebody said one time treating other uh, other people the way you want to be treated. You know, <laughs> pretty good idea I think. And and with and when you do that, you know, then you can develop relationships based on based on mutual respect. You know, and that's the. That's where you're really going to get the good stuff anyway. And one of the problems, to take an example, um, serpent handlers know that I don't handle serpents. Now, I'm not afraid to handle serpents. You know, the, as any good serpent handler will tell you, any damn drunk can handle a serpent, right? That's, that's not an issue. The issue is I don't try to mock their faith. So since I don't believe in handling serpents, I've never been called to handle serpents. I respect those who do but I don't handle, and therefore they don't try to get me to handle because the signs aren't for everyone. So if you don't practice this sign, you can practice some other sign. One of the first things we did was document, let me just make this feel short, but it will we'll catch you on. One of the things, the, when people begin to handle serpents, right, both sides got it wrong, right? The people who handle serpents said, well, this is because God puts a hedge around us and we can't be bit, and, and that turns out not to be true because in every serpent handling church, people who handle, there are people who get bit and people who die. So the notion that handling serpents is something like magic and you can't be bit is wrong. But the other side, the, the scientists got it wrong too because they said, well, um, what's the trick? They freeze their serpents, you know, or they tame their serpents, or they melt their serpents. And that's not true either, because the scientists have never been able to do any good scientific studies about striking serpent hunting, striking behavior. We've done it. We have hundreds of hours of serpent hunting. And let me make it real simple to you. Let's play a game. Okay, the, 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 the thing that I want to document for you is the probability of getting bit by a serpent is a function of two main things, right? Unknown factors, nobody knows, and simply the frequency by which you handle, okay? So let's play again, let's play <laughs> Russian roulette. Yeah. I'm gonna give you a gun I'm going to say, look, there's just one bullet in the, one live bullet in the chamber. I want you to do is spin it. You start here, put it to your head and pull the trigger, and just pass it on. Now, the single best predictor for any one of you is you won't die. Because it's only one out of six, right? Most of the time, you'll work. But if you pass it along enough times, somebody's going to die. Right? So the problem we have, right, is serpent handling behavior 
you, many people go in like one shot. The, uh, Salvation on Santa Mountain is a wonderful book in many ways, but I was there when Covington went in with a camera crew, deliberately going to go in and handle a serpent, get a big picture of himself handling a serpent, and he did, and it's in his book. That's fine. But to the serpent handling tradition, that's offensive. Because the only reason you can handle a serpent for the serpent handling tradition is because God's moved on you to do it. And they'll tell you in every church there's death in that box. Right? You may not believe it. Go up. You may be able to handle it lots of times. But the more frequently you handle, the more frequently you're going to be bit. So here's what happened. The serpent hunting churches have developed a theology. The, the churches that used to handle, Church of God, Church of God of Prophecy, right up here in, in Cleveland, Tennessee, backed away from it. Said they never endorsed it because the more they practice it, the more they got people bit and died. But they're simply not telling the truth. So what serpent handlers did is develop a theology which says, it says you shall take up serpents. It doesn't say you won't get bit, and it doesn't say you won't die. The only important thing is that when you take up a serpent, you're being obedient to God. And in a quote which I was talking about to somebody before uh, this talk, um, I, I mentioned an interesting thing where I was TV station, took a quote that I was doing in an interview, where I, and they said about serpent handling, serpent handlers believe that nobody gets out of this alive. And that's just not at all true. They believe that the only thing that happens is that since you're gonna die, and you're gonna die from something, they don't have a, a better theology or theodicy than you do. They don't know why your mother died of cancer. They don't know why you, you have a child that was born blind, premature, and, and is a mongoloid. They don't know. They say that's, that's up to God. The only thing is that you work on the basis of love and you're obedient to God. And then the important thing is nobody gets out of this alive. It's not a question of whether or not you're going to die. It's only a question of how you're going to die. And if you die being obedient to God, they believe your salvation is assured, right? And if you're disobedient to God, then you're in danger. And so they say, most Supran say, you think we risk our life, right? But you talk about this short period on earth. But we handle serpents, which guarantees us when we're obedient to the Lord, that we have eternal life. So whether we die or don't die is not the issue, it's how we die. And that's a much different point of view. And, and it leaves it open to what, what are you gonna say when the doctor says, well, there's nothing we can do for your child, right? And the question is, how is your child gonna die? And how are you going to respond to the death of your child? And that raises all of these interesting issues of overbeliefs, etc. And the serpent handlers are keenly aware of and involved in that. I don't know of any serpent handler who hasn't seen, known, or heard of people die. Though when Pumpkin Brown, the last person to get bitten, died in Sam Mountain. I was, one of my areas of interest is mysticism, so I'd been studying and working on a mysticism and Catholic of Siena, right, was, was on her way to St. She was a, almost like a Mother Teresa of her day, and everybody knew she was dying, and so they had a death watch, and they wanted to be with her when she died, and as many people do try to capture, right, what is she doing, what is she saying, what is she thinking at the moment of death. And, she, she was dying gradually, and at the moment of death, she put her hand up, just like that, and died. And everybody, right, has speculated, and I was writing on the speculations, what did it mean, and what, you know, and I was at Sand Mountain the day I was supposed to interview Pumpkin Brown. And Pumpkin Brown was at Sand Mountain, and he got bit. And by the way, 
he fell and, and it looked real serious. And so it, people went up and they always asked him, do you want help, do you want medical help? But, but he couldn't respond. And all he did, right, and I got it on video, is he just took his hand, just like Catherine you know, and, and you know he said, I'm going home, and died. So they have the assurance that, and you may think that's bizarre, and you may think, and that's fine, I don't, I'm not here to persuade you about anything, but you have to know what great comfort that is, to know that your child is now in heaven, and someday you're gonna be reunited with your child, right, as opposed to she's just dead, because some damn drunk ran over her and she's rotting in the grave. Could you uh, talk a little bit, <clears throat> I'll, I'll try to describe what you had, um, because I'm, I know you've had kind of an interesting life and you talked yep. a little bit about it. You know, yep. You started as a preacher, mm -hmm. in the military, you're an artist, you're a podcaster, you're a musician. You know, I asked you last night if, you know, all of this work, if you were sort of looking for something. And, you know, and you, you, you look at me and go, well, you know, I, I like to do things, and if I'm not doing things, I feel like I'm wasting my time. Yeah. But we're really interested in this class in the way in which identity is formed. And the way we're defining that is that identity is a manifestation of stories that are told. They're either stories that you tell about you to other people, or there's stories that other people tell about you to other people, or there's stories you tell about yourself mm -hmm. to yourself, or there's stories that others tell about you to themselves. And so, um, you know, you've got a, a life of stories here, but how has the um, sort of the shifting experience, how the shifting experiences in, in your life altered your understanding of who you are? Yeah, so, <clears throat> I'm 42 years old. Uh, from from 18 to 27, I was an independent fundamental Baptist preacher. If you're not mm -hmm. familiar with independent fundamental Baptists, the Southern Baptists were too liberal for us. <laughs> so uh, then uh, from 27 to uh, 2019, I was uh, in various forms uh, and the uh, served in the United States military. Uh, I'm still to this day a reservist. That's how I get insurance because there ain't no insurance for artists uh, in America. So I have to uh, go in and do the, the reserve thing once a month. Um, and then whenever uh, I just had, so I had, I had two crises. I had like when I was uh, 27, 20, about 27, 28 years old, and I was pastor in there in Middlesbrough, Kentucky. I was uh, I, uh, the 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 I had a I had a childhood that kind of led me to looking for some stability whenever I was in my late teens, and uh, that search for stability led me to the Independent Fundamental Baptist Church, where I kind of sunk down in, and uh, I I was pretty much in a in a community of Independent Fundamental Baptists for nine years. And uh, whenever I moved up to Middlesbrough to pastor that church, I, I came out of that community and I was now the preacher, the pastor over this small congregation of about 50 people. And I was out of that echo chamber. And uh, mm -hmm. then I began to think about what it was that I really believed. And... Uh, and then, uh, you know, and then also I got access to high-speed internet uh, and, and Middlesbrough. And so that also kind of led to, uh, just led to, uh, and then I split the church twice. And so uh, it just kind of led to this collapse, um, mental, mental uh, collapse of faith and things. And, Ended up having me running away, and then the military was by was was where I ran because I needed a marketable skill. Honestly, I had a wife and two children, and so we went. I joined the U.S. military so I'd be able to get a paycheck, and and uh, they promised me they'd educate me in avionics. So I said, okay, let me do that, and then. Um, but I had started writing, so we're, let's talk about music. 
whenever I was in Kentucky losing my mind trying to be a Baptist preacher and trying to make sense out of questions and and like dealing with the the dissolution of a whole theological set that I had erected in my brain uh, I began to I turned to music as a way to find uh, an escape it was like it was a way for me to express myself because I don't know how much y'all know about the Independent Fundamental Baptist Church, but they don't really have, like, help for preachers that uh, are struggling, you know. <laughs> and, uh, there's no helpline or nothing like that. And so I started writing songs about it. And I would write songs about my struggle with faith and my struggle with God and all these things. And I would sing them to myself, and they made me feel better. And they made me feel like I could get up and do it again. And they, and it finally, it was through, and then I painted, I started painting about it. And that, and through that, I found the, I found the courage to eventually leave all that behind. And the courage that it, that was required for me to step down. And I knew that when I stepped down from that, um, that that church role that I was going to lose all the relationships that I had for nine years. Um, what little theological education I had came from within that church, and I knew that it was going to be irrelevant once I left that church. And so I had to think really hard about leaving because it was basically not only me leaving that faith, but it was also throwing away nine years of my life, nine years worth of friendships and relationships because uh, they, they're not they're not cool with somebody who just leaves like that mm -hmm. and so but it was through the creation of art that I found like I found I, it was it was almost like self discovery I discovered my I, I discovered who I was in the creation of my art apart from who I was made to be by this the, this 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 uh, this religious community that was very strict and rigid that I had enveloped myself in for for nine years and I began to discover myself and I found out I wasn't that and so I left and then that was the first crisis and then the second one so I had been writing songs and I was I was in the desert in 2014 and I was I'd realized all I'd ever done with my life was bring negativity and violence into the world and 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 then this became this became an idea that really began to eat at me and negativity because that was the kind of preaching I did when I was a young man and violence because that's the work of the United States military and that idea set in my brain like a like a cancer and it becomes so it just becomes something that I couldn't deal with anymore and the whole time I, be, I was writing these songs but I was too scared to play them and so whenever I came back I, I told God one day was sitting in the sitting in the deserts uh, of Qatar that if he would let me go home that I would do my best to try to put beauty in the world through my art that I created and I came back home in 2015, and I played, uh, 14, and then in 2015, I played my very first uh, songwriter show, and I played some of them songs that I'd wrote when I was in Kentucky, losing my mind. I played some, you know, from there in that, then that eight-year period, and it ended up changing my life. And it was, it was, but it was through the creation, like I think maybe, maybe that's the answer to your question. I'm sorry if I'm rambling. Mm -hmm. But it was it was the, through the creation of art that I discovered that I discovered who I was, you know. And it, and it's what it what it's what I feel like I'm the authentic version of myself in the art that I create. So what, what, did, what did it seem like that being a punk rocker would be the right thing to do? To quote, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, it's. Uh, I don't know. It's it, it's like uh, it's it's expression, you know. It's 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 expression. It's beauty in 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 that, you know, and pure expression of what's going on. And then the real beauty happens whenever you take the expression 
uh, are you like, you, you, like when I, when I sing a song that I wrote in Kentucky when I was losing my mind trying to preach it, you know, and then I sing a song and then somebody in the crowd, somebody a hundred miles away from where I was, you know, where, where I wrote that song, they hear it and it moves them to tears or, or they come up to me after this and they, they express how, what it means to them. That's about the most fulfilling thing that I've, that I can, that I can experience that I could ever imagine having. And it happens, it happens sometimes. And it provides great joy, you know, and it, and it provides meaning and purpose for all of that suffering that I, that I, that I, you know, went through. A pretty good question for you as well. When, um, it, it, you know, when you study, you know, a very tight-knit community, and one of the, and I do some similar, similar kinds of work, which is very different community. I study rock and roll bands, you study religious groups. But the, the question that I have uh, for you is the, the degree to which community matters. You know, um, how, how, much, um, how much of who we are and who we perceive ourselves to be is wrapped up in the communities that we join? And are there lessons from your particular, um, the group you've studied, that you think apply in other areas of life. Um, and I'll leave you sort of, I've often dealt with some of the music bands I study that I could just as easily study uh, people who are aligned with a particular political philosophy. It's not terribly different, and I'm not sure it's terribly different for a church congregation either. But could you, could you talk a little bit about just the importance of community and, uh, yeah. Yeah, I think so, and, and uh, it's actually fairly easy because if you want to look at uh, the origin of the serpent tradition, I always tell people one of the ways to understand something that you don't understand is to understand it in terms of things you do understand. So one of the things about the, the holiness tradition, the serpent tradition, is it's linked up with the holiness tradition. And I don't really get in any arguments about you know, what holiness is, except to give you a psychological definition. And holiness says, it's very curious that I would have to go around and ask you what you believe, or what your faith is, or what your religion is. Because the minute we do that, we're alienated, you, you can lie to me, I can lie to you, you can say anything you want, I can't refute it. But here's what holiness says. Your life should be lived as an outward manifestation of an inward spiritual transformation. So holiness is authenticity. So I shouldn't have to ask you what your religion is, I should see it. And that's why if you see somebody that's Amish dressed a certain way, or somebody that has a particular kind of thing they're committed to, you know what they are, right? And one of the things that holiness does that creates a big problem for cultures that allow choice in communities is that they say the, the big crisis is that you can't separate belief from behavior. So that's why holiness people, serpent hunters say, you can make laws against anything you want and we should respect those laws unless you violate a higher law. And if you violate a higher law, then I'm obedient to the higher law rather than the lower law. So the one thing you get from holiness people is a sense of genuine authenticity. They live their beliefs, right? They don't just practice their beliefs. And it creates a real difficulty in a culture like the United States, because one of the things that the culture that we do is we grant you freedom of religion. And that sounds like a good thing, and it is. I mean, in the end, I'm going to come down there. But there is a one thing that's dangerous about it. The Supreme Court has consistently ruled that anybody can have any religious belief they want 
And the court will never, ever make an argument about that. If you believe that God is a chicken and you want to worship him, the court's going to say that's your business. They've never argued against serpent handling as a belief. They've never argued against Mormonism and, and, and polytheism. And they never argued against any kind of form of multiple marriage. That's your belief. But here's the rub. It says that they have an overriding interest. They can control your practice. And that's the problem. You can believe in handling serpents, but the Supreme Court of the state of Tennessee said you can't do it. And I've testified in court cases, and eventually we've won, when I said you cannot legislate against a practice that is a necessary outcome of sincere belief. So in the state of Tennessee, it says it is illegal to handle a serpent in a fashion to endanger any other person. And what they interpret that to mean now, if you wish to handle a serpent, if your religious belief, do it. But you can't do it in a way to endanger other people because we have an overriding interest to protect them. So for instance, it's like they do with Christian scientists. If you're a Christian scientist, you don't believe in disease, you don't believe in medical treatment, right? It's your right to reject it. In fact, uh, the, the Supreme Court has ruled that if you're a person dying, and I'm a medical emergency person, and I come upon you, and I find you, I may assume there's a doctrine called implied consent. What you were really saying is, please help me save my life. But what if you are a different kind? What if you're a Christian scientist who, not, who do not believe in the existence of disease? What the court says is you have the right to reject it. But I can't infer that. So what you can do is wear a bracelet. And it says, I'm a Christian scientist. In case of an accident, call a pro healer. And even though I'm a trained emergency medical person, and I could save your life by just clamping your aorta and getting you to the hospital, I can't touch you. Because you have rejected, right? And it's your right. But of course, the cast comes with children. And what do you do with children? Well, usually what they do is they make the child a temporary ward of the court and then order treatment. And that tells you where culture is community-wise when they favor one set of beliefs over the other. And you know that best when they do it with children. So think about the big debate with vaccination right now. Well, many areas are allowing you to reject vaccination if that's your choice. They may put constraints on what you can do if you're not vaccinated. And more importantly, they may not allow you to refuse vaccination for your child because they say it's the cultural belief that vaccination overrides, right, the lack. And one of the strange things that happens, and then I'll let the community part go, you get really interesting communities when you study people who are religiously extreme in their beliefs. Because what they happen is they typically find cures for all kinds of diseases. So think what happens if you refuse to get vaccinated. No virus hardly ever wipes out everyone. It wipes out the people who refuse to get vaccinated, but some people have a natural immunity, right? And they don't get vaccinated, but their resistance to the virus, so the ones that get vaccinated, don't get vaccinated, die, and the ones that refuse to get vaccinated wind up being a population that's immune to 
the disease caused by the virus. That's happened historically in the plague, right? People became saints for going to lepers and kissing lepers. Tons of lepers, people who got leprosy died. Some who kissed the lepers didn't, they were immune, and then they found the elevation to Satan. So the idea that there's a uniformity that occurs from some source never takes account of the fact that diversity produces unique kinds of groups who are able to solve some things rather than other things. And there are emerging groups of people now that we know historically are immune to viruses, right, that threaten to kill us because we are among those people who have always taken the vaccination and therefore we're still susceptible to the disease. Absolutely, yeah. Not all at once. <laughs> oh, do you have answers for that? <laughs> yeah, you have answers for Dr. Hillary. Well, here, I'll ask you another question. Because uh, I'm, 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 it's something I've been curious about the musicians for a while. And, and I've talked to a number of musicians, seen a number of musicians perform, and I've encountered some music musicians who embrace the, the label of the genre that they're recording in, and they seem to sort of tailor the craft to the expectations of the genre. Mm -hmm. And then there are musicians who sort of rebel against any generic label um, and will say that, no, my band is not the kind of band that the press is labeling us to be, and we're mm -hmm. something else. And since you've performed uh, a, two different genres, I mean, you have a, a punk band called the Psych Peace, um, and then, of course, your, your solo music tends to be considered more folk. Do you find that the when you're performing in those two different bands, that the way you present yourself is different? And do you feel that the sort of the corporate environment that brings the notion of genres around, do you find that confined and problematic, yeah. or is it something that you and your voice? Yeah, and there ain't no difference to me now. I mean, I ain't going to strum the... I'm going to finger pick an acoustic guitar when I play my folk music, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to strum on the back of my fingernail electric guitar when I play with a psych piece, but it's still all the same thing to me. But genres, the term, genres and all that, artists didn't make up all that stuff. That came, that, all, them, all them words come from people that are not artists to describe stuff that they don't, and try to, and try to group stuff into little categories so they can talk about them better. <laughs> but uh, I, don't, I don't care about nothing about genre. I mean, you know, it's, when I go to Europe, they call me country singer, and I'm okay with that in Europe because in Europe they don't have Nashville. But then uh, <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to be called country music here because Jason Aldean's country music, and I, I don't ever want to be associated with that kind of shit. <laughs> I think we ought to give them a chance to play something, to demonstrate. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah whenever you're ready. Yeah, I'm ready. Uh, I have one more question before, I we get, before we get to that. Okay. And, and uh, Dr. Hood brought up something, and, and you just touched on it, so I want to sort of piggyback on what you were talking about before we leave this topic. Yeah. But Dr. Hood talked about the notion of authenticity. Yeah. And authenticity is something that when you study musicians in particular, it's it's part of the fabric of the, the persona of the person on the stage. And so there are some musicians, um, and who comes immediately to mind uh, for me is J.D. Wilkes from the legendary show. Oh, yeah, I love that guy, yeah. Yeah, and J.D. Wilkes, is, uh, he's also a performance artist, and yeah. uh, whenever I go see the legendary Shack Shakers, I expect it to be a performance, but I'm not necessarily looking at it when that's J.D. Wilkes. You know, <laughs> there's some sort of authenticity to what's going on there. I, I view it as a performance. But when I see you on the stage, it comes across, and I think you just touched on it by saying it really doesn't matter if I'm in punk or I'm in folk. There's this sense of authenticity to what you're what you're doing. And, and I'll open this to either one of, of, of you to talk about, but in terms of, of, of that concept, 
you know, that notion of realness. You know, how important is that in your various settings and the things that you do? Well, to me, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's got an importance factor of number one. It's, uh, it's the most important thing. Uh, the kind of art that I like is, and the kind of artists that I listen to are ones that I believe. And uh, if I think that it's fundamentally made for entertainment purposes, and uh, generally I just don't care for it, you know. Or it's, it's, if it ain't something I can believe in, you know, I might, you can play it while we're all sitting around eating at Applebee's or whatever, but I, if I'm gonna listen to something, uh, I mean, if, if it's going to be art that has a transformative uh, impact on someone, I think it kind of has to be yeah. authentic. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you think the, the Dr. Hill, do you think the same thing holds true for the preachers in front of churches? Because, I mean, it's that notion of authenticity. Yeah, know? and I think that, uh, that. I think what he's saying is it hits the nail on the head. We want to, we're trained as academics that everything has, everything has to be partitioned out into conceptual categories. Mm. So we talk about things in all these fine categories that almost go ad infinitum. And yet for the person who in the sense of authenticity that we're suggesting, I think, says that doesn't mean anything, right? That's, that's what you're putting it on. And then it's like, you know, when is this, this kind of course? And when is it this kind of course? And when are you doing psychology? And when are you doing philosophy? And when are you, and, and the answer is, well, I don't know. You, you get to draw the lines, and all of a sudden you're saying, well, that's not psychological enough. That's too philosophical. That's and, and the answer is, there's nothing to do. Is what you're doing approaching and illuminating something legitimate? And if so, Nobody wants to put a label on it. You don't have to. Mm -hmm. it, it's just, it's just a separate thing. Yeah. Well, I'll turn it over to you. Let's you play some music. Okay. Cool. You know, if you want to, if you need a minute, we'll take a quick break. Oh, well. I mean, if anybody needs to call, let's go ahead. <laughs> I'll play y'all some boring folk music. <laughs> Let's see. That's a song I wrote about authenticity. It's called Fake It Till You Make It. <laughs> <laughs> You can get a flashy guitar And play in all the best bars But I hope you know how to smile And it'll help if you can shake it Cause that's the way you gotta make it When you're young and in your pride Cause it's a fight to tell the truth and it's even harder in your youth. No one likes a tune that they've never heard. And nobody wants a song if they can't sing along. And so you give them brown eyed This is a prayer worth praying. In fact, it's something I could never recommend. But you won't never have to fear singing songs that folks want to hear. And when you're done, they'll all shout amen. But it won't have no meaning. And them rhymes will come so easy. With no message in your songs Well, I've heard so many say it You gotta fake it till you make it But you won't be making nothing at all
So I'm gonna write a song and call it Free Bird For all these assholes hollering Free Bird And acting like I give a damn <laughs> I know I'm a crazy hack And I probably won't be invited back But I wasn't making much Anyhow And I decided not to sell What little heart that I've got left And them gigs would surely kill me in time And I believe I'd rather be poor Than sing them songs anymore Casting my pearls Before them swine prayer worth praying in fact it's something I could never recommend but you won't ever have to fear singing songs that folks want to hear and when you're done they'll all shout amen but it won't have no meaning and them rhymes will come so easy with no message in your songs Well I've heard so many say it You gotta fake it till you make it But you won't be making nothing at all song did I? I can't remember hardly. No, I didn't. Um, yeah, we, me and, uh, me and, oh, I should, I should mention this. Uh, I'm playing, I think, on the 30th of this month down at this place called The Wood Shop, and if any of y'all want to come, uh, holler at me. I'll put you on the guest list. All right. Here's a song I wrote about uh, the tendency I have to make everything more complex than it ever should be. It's called Simplicity. <laughs> How many live 
It's less what you got, it's more what you give away. It's singing your song midst the sonic graffiti. Yes, it's simple, really. And what if the Lord's greatest mystery was simplicity? Heaven ain't a dreamland No heaven's in your heart It's less a destination And it's more of a spark You'll find in your midnight Burning so deep Yes, it's simple, really. Yes, it's simple, really. Thank you. Another? We can do another one. Or everyone says they'll come up with other questions. We have people asking questions. Whatever you don't want to do. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh. If you've got questions, you need to ask Ralph to get them recorded while we're in here. Oh. Yeah, we can do that. Well, I mean, I, I will just say that, um, I will say that, you know, this, uh, I said, you know, I set out, I set out, uh, when I set out doing this work with, in the, in the serpent handling in churches, you know, Ralph Hood's work was um, invaluable, and and for me to be sitting up here with him and talking about this subject is is uh, I mean it's really like a, it's a, it's a surreal it's kind of a surreal moment for me. But uh, just because I mean you I don't know if you guys even know this, but I mean the uh, the expert on on that entire community and the largest collection of documentation that, that I'm aware of in the universe is right here on this campus and it's because of this guy right here and uh, it's no small feat I'll tell you that but uh, I mean uh, every I think I think about all that being recorded we're just we're, we're just fine but uh, yeah it is an honor Mr. Hood and Dr. Hood I, I appreciate you coming out and being part of this because there's also a disadvantage because when I began doing it, of course, I was just trying to document the tradition from their wide range and points of view. So all I had starting with, it was independent work, is just, you know, a little BCR camera. Yeah. So it is a shame that I went all these distances and have all these recordings but it's just VCR. Think of what could have happened if we had the kind of equipment we have today. But still, what's even a value of VCR, um, it, that gives you a sense of what is there, what was there. And what's exciting now, the perpetuation of tradition by those that are authentic in the tradition. Most of these people don't learn music. They grow up and learn it from within. They don't read music necessarily. They don't take music lessons, right? They learn within the tradition. And so you can then suddenly go to places where you can see generations have passed down music that's so pure and so beautiful. And the beauty of it is now is it can be captured in really great recordings. Yes. 
Yeah, that's what that's what I've devoted devoted to, and and the process hopefully of putting out uh, putting out a, uh, some type of record uh, yeah. with with all of that on there uh, soon enough. Um, yeah, I, I'll tell you what. I'll play you a song. Here's a song I, I actually um, the, the 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 servant handlers taught me this song. Ooh. Yeah, this is one the uh, I learned. That, now they play it in a major key, really fast, and I'm I play folk music, so I put it in a minor key and play it really slow. <laughs> <laughs> What I thought was so funny about, what I thought was so meaningful, not funny, but meaningful about this number here was when I heard it, I'd grown up in the church and I always heard, you know, I always heard really upbeat songs about how you're, you know, uh, you're going to benefit from, uh, you're going to benefit from your faith and like you're going to go to heaven, you know, you're going to be blessed, you're going to be happy and all this stuff. And when I heard this song, it was like, uh, when it's called When You Go Down. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was like, oh, that's a, that's different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And a different trajectory, you know. And uh, I guess that's probably when faith is most important, maybe. But uh, I fell in love with this song, and so I kind of adapted it to play it at my shows. I put it on my record, actually. My last record uh, I put out in May, uh, all the songs were recorded in Nashville except for one, and it was recorded at the Full Gospel Tabernacle. In Jesus' name, I recorded it with a... Uh, a young lady in the in the faith tradition who sang back up with me. But. You better go down in the name of Jesus when you go down. Go down in the name of Jesus when you go down. Cause let me tell you right now the devil is a liar. You gotta be filled with Holy Ghost fire when you go down. In the name of Jesus when you go down. Cause God's little children got a battle with the devil every new day. There ain't no beginning, there ain't no ending to the games he plays. But you can walk up to him full of Holy Ghost fire. Look him in the eye and say, devil, you're a liar when you go down. In the name of Jesus, when you go down. You better go down with a song and a shout when you go down. You better not fear, you better not doubt when you go down. Cause let me tell you right now, the devil is a liar. You gotta be filled with Holy Ghost fire when you go down. In the name of Jesus when you go down. You better be prayed up and full of the word. You better lean on faith and not on what you heard. And pick up your sword and put on your shield. You better make sure what you got is real. Cause you're gonna make all Satan mad when you go down. And so you better have just what Jesus had when you go down. Cause let me tell you right now, the devil is a liar. You gotta be filled with Holy Ghost fire when you go down. In the name of Jesus when you go down. When you go down. In the name of Jesus, when you go down. Well, thank you. Well, what you think there, Chad? Oh, I love that. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I think one of the things that Dr. Rich just said that I think is worthy pointing out to the, particularly the learners in the room is the degree to which the work you folks are doing, um, whether intentionally academic or not, it's, it's about um, it, it, preservation of history. Yeah. You know, and I think that, that, you know, as Dr. Hood was just saying, you know, as technology changes, the way we preserve those histories change, and the ways we experience them change. But, uh, you know, at the end of the day, it's one of the things that I really appreciate.
appreciate about the, the work that you've done, and I think that Dr. Goodman speaks to that sort of slippery slope of disciplines. You know, at what point are you really a historian with the archives that you've created? And, and I think that that's a wonderful thing to think about, and it's uh, and bringing that into entertainment. Um, yeah. You know, as a way to deliver a message and to, uh, you know, try to bring people together. It's one of the things you and I talked about last night was the way that entertainment and music and sports and those things tend to be spaces where, where uh, divisions disappear and people come together in those moments. So I appreciate what, what mm -hmm. you've done in that respect. And I don't think I've got a question in there, but I just wanted to say so. Mm -hmm. um, and point out yeah. to these folks that there's a historical to what, mm -hmm. what's being done here. And so when you all are going out into the field, you're grabbing a moment in time. And one of the things that I think is beautiful about audio, um, is beautiful and dangerous, is audio and sound disappears as soon as it's spoken. So if it's not recorded in the moment, yeah. you know, with live music or whatever, if it's not recorded in the moment, it's gone. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no way to get it back. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I don't know if that's something that you've thought much about, it's just the way sound works. Oh, yeah. I mean, so, 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 the, so, you know, as far as the music that I've been capturing uh, in this community, it's really, it's, it's required for it to be felt in its fullest extent. It's required that there's eight or nine people that are very uh, knowledgeable on how to, to play their instruments. And so, you know, when, you know, everybody's not a musician, so so when you go to some of these churches, uh, some of them have gotten so small to where now a lot of the the music would sound a certain way if all the people were there that could play it. But because you know, people, the, some I mean, so a lot of these churches are 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 shrinking, you know. And I mean, some and 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 they fluctuate, but uh, but then, like I, me and Doctor Hood were just at a at a service a few weeks back, and um, I mean the the church was filled with musicians, and uh, the what was always remarkable to me about this about about it was that if you were blind and you went into the service, you would never know how many musicians participated because it all sounds the same. The, leads, the lead licks on the guitar sound the same regardless of who's playing them, you know? And it's, and that's when I knew when I first started going, you know, me, me you know, coming from music, I was like, man, I knew immediately the first time I ever went to a service that had that because like they were playing the same stuff. And I knew they all, so they all learned from the same thing. And I didn't know what that thing was, but there's no way you get like four guitar players in a room and they're all playing the same. You can't distinguish the playing from one from another without looking. Mm -hmm. So it become, I was like, well, there's a, there's something here. There's a sound here that, that is, that comes from within the community. And that, and that, so like, I didn't get involved in this because I was worried about being the ethno music, <laughs> right? I, I I got involved with it because the music kicks ass. That's why I like it. <laughs> and, and so it was like I was like, this music is the best rock and roll music that I ever heard in my life. And people are handling snakes while they're playing it. And I've got to find this because I want to listen to it. So I'm I'm in the back of a church you know, like trying for the people not to see that I'm writing down some of the lyrics that I'm hearing them singing. And then I'm going home and I'm like Googling the lyrics. And you, there's nothing on Google, right? I mean, you, I mean, I, that doesn't mean that that's, you know, there's nothing about it. But I was like, man, why aren't these songs ever recorded? Because I wanted just to listen to them. And then I realized, well, they've never, you know, I read Dr. Hood's work and I was like, oh, the reason I can't find them is because it's never been recorded. And I was like, well, this is what I'm doing. You know, and, and so, you know, I mean, here we are in an academic institution, but, you know, I got a degree. I, I got a degree from an unaccredited Bible institute. Like, I, I don't know shit, dude. You know, <laughs> uh, I like, I, so, I, I mean, my qualifications are I can pick a little guitar mm -hmm. and, uh, and I, 
committed a lot of the King James Bible to memory in my youth. And, but that happens to be the skill set that I needed in order to, to befriend this and, 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 and develop the relationships required in this community in order to, in order to capture the recordings I captured. And in fact, like, uh, had I came in there day one with a bunch of recording equipment, they would have just turned me right around, you know. Uh, but it was, it was, I think in a way, because I was, I, and I mean, it was, I was, I didn't realize it, but I was uniquely qualified to do this work. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't that I had did it on purpose, mm -hmm. you know. My life just kind of, I mean, it just kind of, I just, I, I just live every day, you know, trying to create things, and that's what happened. I started going down that path, and then as a result, you know, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm sure, I know, I'm, I know that there will be historical value to these recordings, mm -hmm. and I'm happy about that. But the real thing that I'm happy about is that the music kicks ass, mm -hmm. and people are going to enjoy listening to it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because there's been a lot of music recorded for historical purposes that. Pro I mean, I could listen to it, and I appreciate it for what it is, but it don't move me. Mm -hmm. This music moves me. And so that's why it's important. That's why it was important to me. Well, you so, can come back to UTC, and you'll not know shit at a higher level. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Here I am, Lord, look at me. This big old fancy building with a Bible, Bible Institute degree. Look at it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes they'll ask me to go teach a talk at art schools. And uh, <laughs> the last time they did, I was up at Eastern Kentucky University and they wanted me to teach their art class. And uh, the first thing I did was tell them, I would recommend that you do not go to art school if you want to be an artist. <laughs> I was like, the, probably the best thing y'all can do is stop going in debt to come listen to people like me and go out here and live a life and then paint about it. Because that's the cool of Well, I mean, <laughs> yeah, you're doing something different. But you know, I, and, and the professor looked at me like I was, I, and I was like, look, I mean, you know, you're, if I would have went to art school, then I would have never painted like I do. And if I would have, I would have painted like that picture right there. And everybody paints that picture right there. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So you got to like, I, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm sure they learn stuff and those things that's valuable, but I'm glad I didn't go, mm. you know. I don't know why I went on that rant, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, I've had that same conversation with members students, you know, yeah. about how did you get the hell out of here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Yeah. Good question. Too. All right, the ACDC shirt. <laughs> um, so one thing that I can't help but do when I listen to music is sort of associate words with it. One of the words that I associate while listening to the podcast with these guys hearing was visceral. And then through listening to you guys talk, the question would be, do you think that all music sort of has a visceral channel, a visceral audio is really weird? Um, or that all music is inherently visceral just because of the kind of art that it is? Or do you think that maybe it does just pertain to music that maybe, you know, fits under, and I wouldn't even say it fits under the umbrella because, you know, music and there's so many blurred lines between the kinds of music that you can listen to. Yeah, and, and you know, in my experience, so the one thing I found, uh, I do agree with you that the music is what I would describe it as visceral as well and that it's very raw and emotional. And the thing that always impressed me about the music that I'm trying to document is that is it is, it is uh, like, like, like Dr. Hood said earlier, it's not an outward music. I just played for y'all, okay? I played for y'all to hear a song that I wrote. When you go to these churches, they play, they, they hate playing for me from that mm -hmm. recorder. They're playing, they're, they're upward mm -hmm. focused, right? and not outward focused. And I think that music that is upwardly focused, uh, and because, because when it's outward, you bring in things like commercialness and, 
and how you're going to perceive what I wrote and how you're going to think about me because I wrote a lyric. And it, it, all that goes away whenever, whenever I'm singing, when mm -hmm. I'm singing to God, right? That all goes away. And so as a result, like when I'm in those services, that music feels way different. Then go like last night I was at JJ's Bohemia, me watching Frankie and the Witch Fingers. It was awesome. It was awesome. But that music was aimed at us, brother. Yeah. And did you notice that the crowd moved like it was just an organism? Well we were yeah. in there, I mean, it was like you got sixty or eighty. I was moving there. too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was moving too. It was it was great. I love punk rock. I've, I've, I've loved it since my teens. I, mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's the kind of shows I love to go to. The, that's, not the, that's not what happens at the, at the Serpent Island Church. It's the, it's the same ferocity in the music and the visceralness in the music. Mm -hmm. However, it is not aimed at you. And, and that mm -hmm. it becomes incredibly, um, mm -hmm. it becomes more, and to me, more authentic. Because it, you know, it's it's a more of a one-way thing instead of a two-way thing. And it's really impassioned, and it, and you feel it. Yeah, to pick up on that authenticity, there was a a lot of studies done. You probably remember these and reading about it in magazines, where they said, well, if you play Mozart to little kids, right? Um, what it does is it makes them smarter. So they did tons of studies, and, and they were saying yes, and everybody was playing Mozart, to, a lot of people were playing Mozart to the little kids. Well, it turns out not to be true. And so the people said, well, it doesn't make you smarter. And so they forgot the one thing that was true. If you play Mozart to little kids, they grow up loving Mozart. <laughs> for Mozart, not because it's going to make him do math better. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for the question. Uh, what kind of stories do I like to tell best? I mean, you know, every great story uh, will contain some type of journey, right? And then there's like always the great the great stories have a transformation in them, you know. So so when, when, if I were you and I was going out to these local venues and I was going to tell a story about a local venue, I would find. I would find somebody in that venue or an artist in that venue or a regular in that venue or the owner of the venue or a bartender at the venue. I would find, I would find a, a, a story that revolved around and, and, and how that venue influenced some type of transformation. And that's how you'll get, I think that'll be the most interesting story, you know. I mean, you can always tell stories about uh, that don't require that, but that's always the kind of, I mean, if you look at, like, look at movies and films, like, all the interesting ones are where somebody starts out here, and then something unexpected happens, and then there's a transformation, and then they end up here, mm -hmm. and, it, you know, that's, that's like all the great stories that's ever been written, so I guarantee you, go, I mean, I guarantee you, last night at JJ's Bohemia, if, if we would have been about to work, we could have wrote a thousand stories. Mm -hmm. I mean, there were 75 people in there, and all of them looked like they had something to say. Yep. Cool. And uh, I, I guarantee you, you could you could do it. But you got you know you got to be open-minded and, and being willing to listen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's an important point. The ability to listen is, is much more important than the ability to talk in this instance. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think asking new questions will is the time for you. Yeah, and good questions are founded on listening, good yeah. listening. Mm -hmm. yeah. Good. Other questions from folks in the audience? I think. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking about doing a couple of passion projects too that I've held with me in China and trying to get a few things I'm interested in. One thing I want to ask of you and then Dr. Welcome to give your insights as well is with choosing to share the story of finding people's stories and sharing with others. What made you want 
Well, in, in, in my case, uh, so I did not create the podcast. I was, uh, I had a good friend who worked for the Houston Chronicle and he was the head podcaster for them. And I had just uh, mentioned to him that I was going to these churches and recording some music. And he decided that he wanted to make a podcast about it. So I, mm. I was real fortunate in that, you know. Uh, so he's more to credit for the podcast I'm, I'm uh, the work that I'm really that I've made is you know is, is going to be this record that's going to be the grand finale of what I hope to put out uh, with with my work but I will tell you this a podcast is an incredible medium uh, to tell a story because and, and it, there's there's uh, there's pluses and there's minuses Here's the pluses. It's totally immersive. If, if you do it right with sound design, good production, like the the kind of podcast I hate are two dudes who think that people want to hear them talk and that talking into some cheap. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'm not talking about that shit. I'm talking about like listen to some good podcasts where they put sound design and they're telling stories. They you see a video, you see a movie in your head. Mm -hmm. You know, and and it and it and it, and it, it it's it's better. Like listen to Radio Labs and stuff like that. Those things are incredibly interesting. They can talk about something that's really boring and dull, but it becomes interesting in the way that it's presented. And people can people can take in podcasts also, in uh, in ways that they're not going to watch a video, like while they're riding down the road. I think I think most people probably listen to podcasts while they're driving. Well, man, people, there's a lot of people that got long commutes, you mm -hmm. know, and, um, you know, I, uh, I think podcasts are great for that. The downfall of podcast, the downside of podcast is, uh, and this is totally from a business idea behind it, is that uh, they came out post-internet. And so because they came out post-internet, everybody expects them to be free. And so um, I have spent thousands of dollars and Farrell has spent thousands of dollars creating Alabama Astronaut. We've made hundreds of dollars. It's, it's not been a profitable business, but it was, we never did it for a business. We did it because it was in our hearts to do it. And, and we wanted to make the art. We wanted to tell the story. And we did, and, I'm, and I will forever be grateful that we did. And and there, and I suspect that over time, perhaps it'll pay off. Mm. But if it doesn't, I don't care. But that is the negative. So, like, if 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 you're out here, like, thinking, I want to tell this story, what's the most profitable way? You're not going to choose podcast. But if, if you're thinking about what's the best way that I could immerse someone in a story that I'm telling you, a podcast will hit harder than a documentary because in a documentary, you're being shown what the, vi what the images are. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to, your brain isn't in as, as engaged. Mm -hmm. When you envelop yourself in the, in the story of the podcast, you're, you are more engaged because you're, you're trying to visualize what you're hearing. And with the aid of the sound, like if you listen to our podcast, my, my buddy Farrell, you know, he has, like when I walk into the church, he, he got the, he got sounds of a door creaking open, you know, mm -hmm. and, you know, <laughs> and while you're talking about it, you're hearing it. And so it makes it, 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 it makes it to where, mm -hmm. to where the listener is more engaged than mm -hmm. say watching a YouTube video or a Netflix or mm -hmm. whatever. And I think one of the advantages to that too is something is lost with one of the things I'm doing with my students this year is not allowing them to make any presentations in PowerPoint, right? Because it, it's much less effective than actually doing what he's saying, where you have to use vision and all kinds of things and imagine, and it's not handed to you in a canned format.
Mm-hmm. Which weren't as positive across the board as some folks might think. Some folks complained about TV versus the radio. They said that they preferred radio because the pictures were better. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know, and I think that you, you sort of encapsulated that. And it's that it's the, someone else is in control yeah. of the picture. They're leading you in some direction, but it's up to you. It's kind of like when you're reading a book, you know, I have a picture of the yeah. picture to build it rather than. Yeah, yeah. yeah a pod, podcasts are, and I, I think, I, I, I truly believe after, I didn't know really a whole lot about podcasts. I had listened to a handful of them. Uh, and then my buddy Farrell uh, started making a podcast uh, about what I was doing. And um, then, you know, then I really began to, to try to dig around and see what podcasts were all about. And I think it's like really a, a I, I think it's just not even, it's just started to scratch the surface of how good uh, you, that they can be, you know. Mm-hmm. I mean, some, what, what's going to be the magic, the, the, I, I hate to even say this because I hate business and art together. It, it disgusts me and I'm terrible at the two things. And fortunately, I have people in my life that run the business part of this or else we would all be broke. But mm-hmm. uh, the, um, Somebody's got to figure out how to make podcast profitable. When that happens, s- storytelling, books, uh, news articles, they're all going to go to that format because it's so much more it's so much more engrossing and it's so much uh, it's so it, it would be it would be much easier to 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 take in. You know, audiobooks, man, are freaking boring, right? They're boring. But now if you could put it in a podcast sound design and you and you put it in a way where it's like it, it it's uh it, it's it, it hooks you you know mm-hmm. but the thing is is there's no money so because there's no money there's nobody you know none of these mm-hmm. businesses are going to invest a lot of money into it one of the things that i've asked you excuse me the class to do when they're listening to your podcast is listen to where the material comes from you know because as you just mentioned some of it is you out but some of it's archival footage, some of it's reaching out to an expert, some of it's, uh, you know, yeah. some of it's sound effects. Yeah. You know, but, and, and I'm curious, you know, on, on your end, the, I know you're the subject of your interview quite a bit, but what degree did you play in the research of really out archival footage and other things? I did all of that. You did all that? Yeah. yeah. Now, as far as, well, I mean, I did all the, like, the recordings and, like, uh, Farrell was, Farrell was the guy who, who got all the expert interviews and kind of played the role of journalist, but like the, uh, the recordings that were captured in the field, they were, they were all, all of mine. Yeah. yeah the archival stuff. The archival, stuff. yeah, all the archival stuff was stuff I collected and, and uh, yeah, I've been, I've been, yeah, I've been trying to collect yeah, this. I'm trying to make sure these folks understand that there's other research that can be done and there's other stuff that you can pull into this podcast that you don't necessarily have. Oh, absolutely. If I, if, yeah, if it was, I mean, you know, when you're talking about, like, if you're talking about somebody that's dead, you're, you're not going to record them. <laughs> so you better find somebody that did. You know, I mean, in our podcast, there's footage that Dr. Hood allowed us to use from the archives right here in UTC. Uh, he did with an interview with uh, Billy Somerford, and, uh, who was a preacher that Ralph uh, knew very well. And, um, uh, Ralph let us use uh, some of the footage that he had in this thing. So, um, yeah, I mean, uh, it, it, p- podcasts are incredible. Uh, why don't some of y'all go out and figure out a way to make money with them? And when you do, let me be the first to know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, absolutely. Uh, yeah, there's a there's a few different so so all the all these churches are like independent like they there's no boss like or a pope or a bishop or anything that's kind of like the overseer of a bunch of them. so so you kind of have to deal with individuals at each diff, different congregation and so yeah I mean uh, not all of them are gonna would would let me come. But uh, you know, I went where I was welcome, and and uh, 
and I didn't just barge in with my stuff. You know, I have a, I had a little Sony um, handheld recorder. It was about this big. It runs on batteries. That's all I originally took in with me. And uh, I would ask them. I would be like, "Hey, this is." I'd show it to them. This records audio. I would like to capture the sounds if I could from the church tonight. Some of them let me do it the first time I was there. Some of them was like, no, not tonight, you know. And so I would respectfully put it up, and I would go to church there, and then I would go again. And uh, and after going a few times, and and them seeing that I wasn't there to exploit or, uh, you know, to do something that they w w didn't uh, approve of, and then they allowed me to do it. But uh, when 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 you're not allowed to do it, just don't do it. You know, <laughs> just turn around and don't do it. But like, I wouldn't keep barking up the tree. You know, <laughs> like uh, sometimes people aren't going to be open to you coming in with a camera or a or a you know a recording device or even a pen and paper. You know, sometimes like Doctor Hood says, it pays to be a friend first. You know. Yeah. And even then, there are some churches that simply don't allow filming. Yeah. There are other churches that it's up to the congregation if you film or you video. And it can change. And then also there are some churches that say, okay, but the people that don't want to be filmed or on video, they, they're over there. Don't put your video yeah. Over there, over here. So it gets very, very complex. Yeah, I went to, there's one church in Kentucky that I went to for nine months. After, after about the second or third service, they let me take my small recorder in. Well, what I always wanted was to get full-blown, um, multi-track audio live recording. So to where it could be taken and mixed, right? Mm -hmm. And so... <clears throat> The, and the, what that requires is me coming in, um, running running a uh, running a microphone to the guitar amp, running lines out of the bass amp, lines out of the organ. I have to mic, put several mics on the drum kit. I had to I had to get splitters and run them to the PA that they were using to to mic each individual microphone. Then go in the corner and set up a computer in a church in a snake handling church. Set up a computer. Okay, the, the, I was asking a lot. You know, and it, but, it, but after going to that church about nine months and, and developing real friendships, uh, I mean, some of these people, I mean, I, you know, I, I, I talk to two or three times a week. They're my, they, but they, uh, they finally allowed me to, to do that. And so I've mm -hmm. got hours and hours and hours of, 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 of that, of that captured now, which, um, I mean, it's, uh, I can't. I can't wait to get it all mixed down to where we can put it out in a form where people can 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 hear it because it's it's uh, it's 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 what I, I mean in my opinion. It's it's really some of the greatest religious music, gospel music um, that's ever been played. You know, at least in my opinion. There's a moment in your podcast where I think you, you speak to sort of a maybe a failure or a shortcut. You actually say in the podcast, you know, like how stupid it was me to think I was going to do this without, you know, having experiencing some failure. Oh, yeah. And, and my recollection of that moment had more to do with the folks that you went in to record being someone less than authentic or maybe yeah. putting on a, a show as opposed to, I mean, but can you talk about the degree to which failure is part of the process? And I think that's something that Dr. Hood can speak about as well. I, one of the things that I ask these folks to, to be aware of is don't be afraid to fail yeah. at something. And so sometimes it helps to actually <coughs> somebody who's had some measure of success talk about failure. There's a lot of a lot of failures that you can talk about. One of them is that there are um, people that uh, churches where there are showboaters, you know. Um, you bring out the camera and they go to the box and they're handling serpents and, and so that it's, uh, it interferes with the service and the authenticity. And there are other things, uh, churches that you want to go maybe record but 
it's so damn boring <laughs> and so <laughs> poor. That, so there's a whole range. And so yeah. you, you have to be aware of the very presence of the camera or the audio is an interactive thing that modifies, even though you're trying to be unobtrusive and stuff, it modifies. Yeah. And one way to get around that, of course, is to do it secretly, but that clearly is unethical and inappropriate. Mm. So you've got to recognize that, that I do think that there are churches where the handling is also partly a function of there's a television camera present, and they're mm. going to be on TV. Ah, uh, sure. Let's see here. What kind of song y'all in the mood for? Don't all speak at once now. <laughs> what you want to hear, Chad? Anything in particular? Well, I'm going to switch on the spot. I think the hard song will require you to remember something in the box. So you'll be All right, I'll, I'll give it my best shot, but <laughs> I'll give it my best shot. Now, if I forget the words in this, y'all are just going to have to forgive me. This has got more words in it than anybody should ever write in a song. If you're trying to be a songwriter, do not do this. Well, sometimes I think we're already dead. Or this trap that I call time is just some inception-like dream state I'm in as I lay dying. I think maybe we never existed at all We're just some five cents at hallucination Or just the mirror image of a higher reality Beyond our comprehension And I lie awake at night And I can't keep my mind from wondering About what it all means That I have the ability to wonder what it all means and you know that nobody in this whole wide world can give you the definition of consciousness that doesn't venture off into religion or some kind of absurdist pseudoscience. And since I started listening to both sides without caring on to which side I fell, I found out that there were more than two sides if you really want to know a subject well, which only led me to more heartbreak. As I thought about all the fights that have been started by two sides And neither one of them were truly wrong or right And then I started considering the brutality that I witness every day And how numb to the side of human suffering that I'd become in my middle age Cause all the fascists and the commies been spewing out their dogma Taking over the conversation, any voice that's devoid of an agenda has been removed from consideration. And I started thinking about the weapons of mass destruction, biological, chemical, and nukes. And we could have had them all fired from the push of a button of this orange presidential buffoon. And so I started reading up on how I was going to survive a nuclear apocalypse. And after my research, I Included, I didn't even want to survive to live in a world like that. So even if I try to be positive and convince myself someday we might actually see peace, well, it's then that I realize in like a billion years or something our planet's going to cease to be because the sun has gravity too, you know. We're being pulled in as we orbit. And if we don't find a way to destroy ourselves, then the sun's going to do it for us. So... La, 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 turn off your mind. La, 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 turn off your mind. La, 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 turn off your mind. Because an active mind is the devil's playground. Well, that was the first verse for y'all there. Uh, let's see if I do the second one. 
Well, then my mind turned to the scientists and the explorers and the greatest amongst us all who gave their lives to learning and research and made great discoveries about the world. And then it occurred to me that all truth exists long before some learned man makes it known. I mean, if you think about it, he don't equal MC squared just because Einstein said it was so. And now considering this, science kind of seems like a waste. I'm going to devote myself to art. At least an artist creates something of value, a unique representation of his heart. Then I looked around at this plastic world and their frowning faces and their disdain for beauty. And I seen all the poor starving artists dwelling at the fringes of a cold society. But you know that we would not have fur release if it were not for this individual named Beethoven. And we'd certainly not have the White Album if Paul McCartney never met John Lennon. And I said, well, maybe that's my problem. I miss my Lennon. Somehow that chance done passed me by. And that's the reason I'm sitting here singing this stupid song and losing my freaking mind. And then even this stranger thought my tortured mind began to ponder. Lord, I wonder what if Einstein would have met McCartney first. My John Lennon was studying the great wonders. I mean, I ain't saying it would have been the Beatles, man, but it would have been interesting to see what they put out because I know that Einstein had some pretty cool hair, but I wonder if he could twist and shout. Maybe if Einstein had been singing, oh, bloody, oh, blonde, instead of drafting the letter to Roosevelt that paved the way for a nuclear bomb, then a little boy from Nagasaki could have married a pretty young girl from Hiroshima, and they could have sang, oh, bloody, blonde, together and taught their children songs by the Beatles. And I can't imagine that the guy that wrote Imagine would have been any use in a science lab unless that lab had the sole purpose of giving world peace a chance. And so we got to give Lennon to science and Einstein to McCartney. We got to find a way to get back in time. But then I realized if we ever build a time machine, it'll be based on the scientific work of Albert Einstein. So la 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 la. It's the 403rd freak out because I happen to belong to a thing called the 403rd maintenance unit at Keedsville Air Force Base, and that place will make you lose your mind sometimes. I was on, uh, yeah, I was sitting on an airplane actually, uh, <laughs> doing a little thing they call national service. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I thank y'all for coming and listening. I hope y'all, uh, I hope you found a little something in this. Cool. And, uh, thank y'all so much. Oh, man, thank you. Cool. Yeah, it's it's good. It's good. For all of us, I really yeah. appreciate it. Thank cool. you, Dr. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, thank y'all so much for coming, and thank you, Chad. And, uh, yeah, that's cool. Yeah. And Abe's plan, as he said, on September 30th at the wood shop. I know I've got at least one team in here that's planning on observing that location. And Abe already told you that he can put you on the camera. Yeah, if y'all want to come now, just make sure you come and tell me that you was in this class. And don't tell your friends to tell that. But if y'all tell me, then I'll, uh, y'all, we'll, we'll get you on, we'll put you on the guest list. We'll get you in there. Yeah. And you're also planning, you're uh, leaving from here and going up to Americana Fest in Nashville. And you'll yep. be there tomorrow. And then you're going to be back down in Georgia. 
On yes. Saturday and Sunday, it tends to rest at Howard Pastor's Garden. If anybody wants to make a road trip down, and you're speaking on Sunday and playing on Saturday. Yeah, playing Saturday, speaking Sunday, yeah. and showing my art uh, both two days. If you like, uh, if you like art uh, and you like outsider or folk art, then uh, it's the place to be this weekend down in Somerville. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And we also uh, I think I've got my copy of Abe's book back here with some of his art. Oh and, yeah. And uh, also. Back yeah, yeah, yeah. So if anybody in here wants to see some of the other things that he's done, um, it's up there. I'll also sort of add a little, 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 little note to it. So when I got the book, I immediately opened it up and I looked at it and I said, damn, this looks exactly like the Jimmy Morrow. Yeah. And so then I reached out to Dave and I said, hey, you, you're going to have to look at me so neat. And Dave's like, well, I gave Ralph that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all so much. Thank you all, everybody.